It is Wednesday, February 14th, 2018. It is 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and so you know what time it is. It's time for a little bit of coin metal. And yes, I most certainly did get my ass kicked at Jiu Jitsu today. Not much victory, just teeny tiny bits here and there. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was actually kind of a kind of a tough day actually. I'm gonna get get down to it. You know, we worked a little bit of a uh, little bit of side control, a few uh, escapes little shrimp escapes from the uh from side control getting your getting your guard back resuming the action in your favor or at least in a better position and uh yeah so we worked that quite a bit and then we did uh we did a little bit of positional sparring from the same position and um i did manage to get my my blue belt opponent in a um in kind of a triangle position, I also got him into a back take position, um, and I think he managed full mount on me twice. But next time, next time. But yeah, as far as uh, as far as the show goes, I haven't had a whole lot of time today to really reflect and get it in my mind what I wanted to talk about. You know, I just chewing a lot of air with people about Segwit today, and I reviewed a couple a couple little articles here and there, but most of it just, I don't know, it's kind of reflecting the, the um, how should I say it, the market sentiment at the moment. It's still a little sideways motion on Bitcoin. We are starting to see a little bit of a pickup. However, I'm not 100% enthusiastic about it at the moment, only because I... I see the possibility that it could still it could still drift a little bit down. Whether or not it will, I couldn't say definitively. I don't think anybody could, and if they said if they said they could, they're probably lying to you. But uh, yeah, as far as what we're going to be covering today, I got a half a million ar- articles in my tabs, so we won't be without content. I'm just not entirely certain what it's going to be at the moment. That's all. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw down into some music. A little bit of first dance. And, you know, earlier today, I was talking to somebody on Facebook. And they'd uttered three words. And it led me to believe that they needed a little bit of blind by corn here on Coin Metal. And that was Slipknot with Custer. Man, I love that song. You know, I I kind of I kind of drifted from Slipknot for a little bit there, uh, and I don't know. I I I think there's potential still left in the project. Uh, you know that they haven't really run that road fi- to its final end. Uh, mostly because uh, Corey is still out there with uh, Stone Sour. I think that, that that's an indication that he still wants to perform. You know, and so what? whatever the the issue is, you know, whether everybody's just like off doing their own projects and involved in other stuff, I don't know. But hopefully there'll be some sort of resolution to that and we will get slept not again. Or at least a new one. <laughs> anyway... I, you know, I got to start it off with something that's uh, it's kind of interesting to me. Mostly because in cryptocurrencies, um, there's always been this specter of regulation. You know, what, what officials will think of us and what they'll try and do about us and so on and so forth, right? Well, I've always found that really kind of silly. Well, more than so, yeah, I, I kind of find it offensive, really. Um, mostly because we are using the most accountable means of transacting monetary value that has ever been invented. I mean, that, that's, that's the, biggest, the biggest point of offense to me. However, 
there is another point to it that I find just as offensive. And it's this, that all of the standards for what we consider fraudulent activity and theft and all that other business and embezzlement and misappropriation, abuse of trust and so on and so forth, was set by conventional markets, number one. But number two, despite all of the regulation, despite all the seals of approval, we still get reports back and eventually crimes commit, uh, of crimes being committed to uh, by these huge entities that, you know, again, they adhere to, they supposedly adhered enough to get the approval, the stamp of approval of the SEC, the CFTC, the FDIC, whoever it is that's their regulatory body, they got the approval of it. Otherwise, they would not be functioning out in the open market. And despite that, they get they get caught doing this shit all the time, man. I mean, come on. <clears throat> So, really, you know, it, it becomes a question of, like, what exactly is the function of the regulation if the regulations themselves don't actually stop criminal, manipu- criminal levels of manipulation and malfeasance and just all-around bad behavior? You know, theft, so on and so forth. What, what, what's the function of it if it doesn't actually stop these things? I mean, I, I think as a rear view mirror, as a basis for prosecution in the event of actual criminal activity, okay. I think that's, that's a, a perfectly good realm for the likes of the SEC or the CFTC to be in. However... <laughs> I don't think that putting a, putting a special demand or a special burden on ICOs or cryptocurrencies or any of these other digital assets we create and trying to regulate them as, as we have with regular conventional markets, I think it's just fucking ridiculous, honestly. It, and... I don't know. There's something wrong with the people that are communicating with our uh, officials with regard to cryptocurrencies. They keep using these stupid fucking terms like distributed ledger technology and blockchain. And they all abhor Bitcoin. Now, all of us involved in cryptocurrencies, and I know I've ran over this ad nauseum, know this... But the only way you get a good blockchain is by having independent knowing miners mining your fucking coin and getting a coin, getting getting some sort of incentive for performing this duty. You know, somebody got to pay. You know, and if they're not if they're not feeling adequately compensated, they'll move somewhere else. But when you take the choice of whether or not somebody is mining something away and you do shit like shadow mining and fucking uh, I saw something on Salon or, or about Salon where supposedly uh, they're they're wanting people to either turn off their ad blocker or mine Monero with their browser while they're on Salon.com. If that's the case, I just won't go to Salon.com. They can go fuck themselves. I don't care. There are other sources of information than Salon.com. And if they think that mining Monero with my my computer is a, <laughs> is a good way to fund themselves and keep the lights on, there, there's something else wrong with their fucking business model. And, and like I said, they need to go fuck off. Anyway, so as I was saying about already regulated entities I, I'm going to th- throw down this first article just because I need to do it um, <laughs> here it is this one is um, 
it's on the um, it's on Reuters.com, and uh, this is authored February fourteenth, two thousand eighteen, at twelve oh seven p.m. Updated approximately. I gotta reload it because I've had I've, I've had the browser in here forever, so about seven hours ago. Okay, mm-hmm. Charlie Munger urges regulators to ease off Wells Fargo and blast Bitcoin. Why am I not surprised? Charlie Munger, the longtime business partner of fellow billionaire Warren Buffett, said on Wednesday it is time for regulators to, quote, let up on Wells Fargo and Co., which will end up, quote, better off as it corrects a series of mistakes in how it treated banking customers. And so far, my my treatment by Wells Fargo has been stellar, so I can't complain too much. Anyway, continuing. Munger spoke at the annual meeting of Daily Journal Corp., the Los Angeles-based newspaper publisher he chairs, where he also denigrated Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin equals BTSP. What the fuck is BTSP? Hmm. As, quote, noxious poison and urged reforms in the healthcare system. He spoke less than two weeks after the Federal Reserve took the unprecedented step of curbing the San Francisco-based bank's asset growth until it fixes its shortcomings. (laughs) You guys are doing too much coke. (laughs) Daily Journal typically draws little attention from investors, but CNBC broadcasts the meeting on its website. That is because the company's star attraction is Munger, 94, who has four decades also been vice chairman at Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway, Inc., which is Wells Fargo's, Wells Fargo's largest shareholder. <clears throat> of course, Wells Fargo had incentive systems that were too strong in the wrong direction, and of course, they were too slow in reacting properly to bad news, but... Practically everyone makes those kind of mistakes, Munger said. Quote, Wells Fargo will end up better off for having made those mistakes. Quote, I think it's time for regulators to let up on Wells Fargo. They've learned. The San Francisco-based bank has been beset by scandals for <laughs> for deceiving customers such as, such as by opening unauthorized accounts and forcing them to take out an auto insurance they did not need. Wells Fargo shares gained 2.7% to $59.55 dollars that is or $59.55 on Wednesday. Though Wells Fargo may be learning its lessons, Munger said the banking industry remains quote a dangerous place to invest because of the temptation for chief executives to take unwise long-term risks risks to boost short-term results. <laughs> yeah, it's because there's no real fucking no real commerce going on out there. They're making it all up. Continuing. Buffett is credited Munger with broadening his investment horizon and to seek out great companies at fair prices rather than emphasizing fair companies that can be bought cheaply. Bitcoin is totally asinine. For Munger, that leaves no room for Bitcoin, saying the recent, quote, craze in the cryptocurrency is totally asinine and a means for people to make a quick buck. He urged the government to help wring out its excesses. Bitcoin is a noxious poison, Munger said. The more popular it got, the more I hated it. Yeah, of course, it was taking business away from me, dude. Munger also endorsed the the plan announced by Berkshire, Amazon.com, Inc., and J.P. Morgan Chase and Co., to set up a healthcare company for their employees to combat spiraling costs that Buffett has called a, quote, tapeworm on the economy. The current system runs out of control on the cost side, causing behavior that is regrettable and evil, Munger said. 
It's not right to bleed so much money out of our dying people, Munger said. I'm all for somebody trying to figure it out. Munger also expressed concern about rising U.S. government debt levels, calling it new territory for us, though he expressed no alarm about the current economy. He said higher inflation may follow and that long-term U.S. treasuries, whose prices can fall quickly as yields rise, remain a losing bet over the long haul. Munger fielded questions for two hours. He and Buffett, 87, are expected to field shareholder questions for an even longer period, five hours, at Berkshire's annual meeting on May 5th. Given their ages, that meeting is likely to be among their last, and Berkshire is preparing for their succession. Last month, it promoted executives Greg Abel and Ajit Jim Jane to vice chairman, overseeing the non-insurance and insurance businesses, respectively. They were they are widely considered the front runners to succeed Buffett as chief executive officer. Alluding to his age, Munger on Wednesday said he was quote very surprised to be here and drew laughter by referring to a woman who said on her own 94th birthday, I'm very pleased to be here. In fact, I'm very pleased to be anywhere. Yeah, I bet you are, Charlie. (laughs) So, yes, of course, Mr. Charlie Munger would hate Bitcoin. Why? Because it's competition for him. It doesn't need him. It doesn't need it doesn't need Wells Fargo. So, you know, the the question then is what does Wells Fargo's relationship with the rest of the world become if enough of us are actually using Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies? It becomes one of servant again. They become our servant again, instead of the ones that have been running the economy for the last century. You know, all of the investment, the nature of it, the way we've gone about it, uh, what was invested in, all of that has been directed pretty much by banks for at least the last century, and that's because they've been the source of the money. They've been the people that have been willing to back things like government. But now what happens when the hands holding the value, the monetary value... What happens when they change? When they're no longer the Goldman Sachs, when they're no longer the Berkshire Hathaway, when they're no longer, you know, George Soros or Charlie Munger or any of these other people? What indeed? See, I think what happens is the values change. Because the people change the values that the company and the monetary value hold dear changes as well and I I think that's something that's needed to happen for quite a long time and I think that cryptocurrencies will eventually lead to that and so yeah am I surprised that Mr. Charlie Munger hates Bitcoin no I mean primarily the reason I mean I already enunciated the primary reason but another reason would be that Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies would have made, I mean, as they currently function. Now, if we start getting into that fucking Lightning Network bullshit then all, and all that off-chain bullshit, then we're talking about a whole different animal then. But as long as it's happening on-chain, you, you can't do the shit that they were doing. You can't just make a whole bunch of wallets and start charging them fees in the name of your customers. They're going to notice that kind of shit. You know, it's like if you were to to go and do your online banking and find some charge on there, and it's just like, I did not buy tile in Greece. You know, I, I've never been to Greece, and somebody's got somebody obviously hacked my shit and bought some tile for their villa in Greece, and my bank needs to help me straighten that out, right? Well, now what what if you saw that your bank? was charging an address that was not the one that you typically used with them. 
but it was drawing off, it was drawing funds off of your account. You'd be like, uh, hey, wh- what's this business? And they're like, oh yeah, we started a second account for you, and we've been some diverting some funds from your other account to this one to uh, pay the uh, the I don't know the maintenance fee for the account. You know, and they've just been sucking like seven bucks a month out of your account. You know, you would notice that, and you, you'd probably react to it a lot quicker than a year. I mean, because Wells Fargo, they did that shit for a long time. I think it was like five years or some shit like that, where they were making accounts in their customers' names, and then charging them fees and shit on uh, on the transactions. Like, they, they would run the transactions through there and because it didn't have any funding, because the customer didn't know it existed, they'd get beamed for overdraft fees. And, of course, it, a lot of times, I, I'm sure it would get paid to the wrong account or they would eventually pay it to the right account. You know, the, the customer would specify, dude, pay it to the fucking account that, you know, pay it to my account. You know, and they would say, oh, okay, and whichever one was read, they put it to you know, or not. In any case, so yeah, I I don't I don't think that Wells Fargo would have been able to do a lot of the things they've been doing. And as a matter of fact, things they're probably still doing at some level. Um, w- with all of it happening on a blockchain, on a publicly accessible blockchain, give me a fucking break. Anyway. On to some other poison. And this one is... uh, I've been commenting on this a a bit, and uh, I I really don't know what to think of it. You know, I I think maybe a lot of people are asleep at the wheel and uh, have just been accepting the idea of their computer being on all the time and the resources of their computer being, being sucked up by applications and whatnot that are recording them. And so now they're getting on to crypto jacking as a means of funding things. And I, I, I'm like wholly against that. I mean, it, primarily because it takes a lot of the choice out of things. You know, if the, the shit's like running and you don't know that it's running, that's taking the choice out of it. If, if you, you know it's running, but you've only got a, a couple options with regard to to like what it's mining and you only get a certain cut of what's actually mined I I don't see that as a positive thing I mean that's I don't know that's just my my feeling on it I really feel like the best way to do this shit is keeping the networks as restricted as possible to actual voluntary miners you know this shit about you know stuffing little scriptless codes in your in your browser you know your browser uh, extensions and shit and and shadow mining Monero in the background I, I think that's fucking bullshit but here we go we got this article I, I think this is actually something different but I, I, that is something we are going to be covering today though this one is on uh, fortune.com Hackers stole $50 million in cryptocurrency using, quote, poison Google ads. Hmm. For years, hackers have robbed Bitcoin investors, emptying their cryptocurrency wallets without fear of being caught, thanks to the relative anonymity of the blockchain. Now, Cisco has exposed the thieves behind a string of particularly flagrant attacks. A Ukrainian hacker group dubbed Coin Hoarder has stolen more than $50 million in cryptocurrencies from users of Blockchain.info, one of the most popular providers of digital currency wallets, according to a report published Wednesday by Cisco's Talos cybersecurity team. The report explains how thieves preyed upon their victims using a, quote, very simple yet treacherous technique. Buying Google ads on particular search keywords related to cryptocurrency to, quote, to poison user search results and snatch the contents of crypto wallets. 
This meant people googling terms like blockchain or Bitcoin wallet saw links to malicious websites masquerading as legitimate domains for blockchain.info wallets. For example, the poison ads included spoofed links with small with small type small types like blockchain blockchain spelt with i e n dot info slash wallet and blockchain dot info, which sent visitors to a landing page that mirrored actual websites of the company blockchain, which runs both the domains blockchain dot info and blockchain.com. The legitimate sites appeared lower in results than the poison links, according to Cisco's report. Fooled into believing they had come to the right place, victims then entered private information that allowed the hackers to gain access to their actual wallets and take their digital money. Quote, the attackers needed only to continue purchasing Google AdWords to ensure a steady stream of victims, the Talos team led by Jeremiah O'Connor and Dave Maynard said in their report. Cisco, which investigated the quote, massive phishing campaign for more than six months in partnership with Ukraine's cyber police, noted that the coin hoarder group's method has since become increasingly common in the wild, with attackers targeting many different crypto wallets and exchanges. Schemes involving digital advertising promoted, promoted on Facebook to, I'm sorry, fa- Prom- I'm sorry, I fucked that all up. Schemes involving digital advertising prompted Facebook to ban all cryptocurrency ads earlier this year, and Google is also working to root out abusive ads, a spokesperson recently told East, East or sorry, Fast Company. The coin hoarder thefts occurred over the course of three years, but surged at the end of 2017 as Bitcoin prices soared to close to $20,000 with $10 million stolen between September and December. In one burst, the hackers made off with $2 million in the span of less than four weeks, the Talos researcher said. It's possible the value of the thieves' bounty totals much more than the $50 million now, as Talos based its calculations on cryptocurrency prices at the time of the theft. Phishing, which is just one of several techniques used to steal Bitcoin, is also deployed by the notorious North Korean hacking ring, <coughs> hacking ring known as the Lazarus Group, which is likewise accused of penetrating phishing attack, uh, perpetrating phishing attacks to steal cryptocurrency. Cisco found that coin hoarder scam disproportionately ensnared those from underbanked regions where cryptocurrency has caught on as an alternative means of storing wealth. Residents of African countries such as Nigeria and Ghana made up the majority of those who landed on the malignant websites. In its report, Cisco also revealed some of the hackers' own Bitcoin wallet addresses to which it was able to trace the stolen funds with the help of Ukrainian law enforcement. Unmasking the actual thief or thieves is more difficult as Bitcoin addresses are pseudonymous and don't, can't, don't contain the name of the person to whom they belong. But, Cisco's Talos researchers are scouring the internet for clues, including forums such as Reddit where the coin hoarder victims have discussed the theft. While identifying the individual who owns a specific wallet is extremely difficult, we can still look for open source intelligence surrounding the wallet the researchers said in the report. One day, victims might even be able to get their money back, through those such happy outcomes are so far exceedingly rare. Yeah, no kidding. Definitely. Oh, here we go. Here, have some kool <laughs> uh, Anyway, so yeah, there you have it. A lot of this stuff has been going on on uh, Twitter uh, where people will create a Twitter account 
where the name looks almost identical to yours, but not quite. And they will ask you for money. And so one of the things I did was I, I posted it on Twitter and uh, I said, it, if I ask you for money, tell me to fuck myself. <laughs> because I will never ask you for money. <laughs> I mean, if I do, it's because I've done something for you and the arrangement was that you were supposed to pay me for doing this thing and we'd made that arrangement prior to me doing the thing. Then I would ask you for money. Otherwise... I will not ask you for money. And if I do, it'll be verbally. I know that can be duped, but not as easily as this. So, there you have it, folks. Watch out for your own bunghole. Don't be so quick to click on the first item that shows up in Google, because hackers can use Google AdSense too. Now, why they're actually doing such a thing as Google AdSense is beyond me. I really think that your websites should be rated by how popular they actually are as far as relevancy to the subject matter that you're looking up. But that's my own perspective. I, I know that a lot of people don't share that and they think that it's cool with your your search results being manipulatable and alterable to increase traffic to their website. But, you know... To me, when you do something like that and your website doesn't really match the, the desired search criteria that I'd put out, um, that makes me resentful of, of your shit. And I, I know that that's such a, uh, I don't know, it's kind of frivolous for just one person, but you know, if it happens to enough people... You know, these things like start looking at DuckDuckGo and, and other search engines that don't use the same algorithms that uh, Google does and don't have the same ad incentives that Google does. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw back down into some music. And uh, as far as what to put in, man, I got so much good stuff these days. Oh, fuck it, Vicarious by Tool. Here on Coin Metal. And that was Behind the Sun by Mashuga. Had a little bit of Space Grass there ahead of that one. And uh, Space Grass, when I'm listening to it, you know what it reminds me of? And, and this is because it's so recent. The car that Elon Musk <laughs> launched <laughs> on, on the last rocket he sent up. Uh, supposedly, I, I guess there's a vehicle, and I, I haven't looked it up, but I, I guess there's actually a live feed from from a video camera in the vehicle, and it's like orbiting Earth right now. It's got like a a um, a dummy astronaut in the uh, in the seat for it. And I was just thinking about that. Like, you know, it's kind of heavy metal ish. The the movie heavy metal. It's kind of kind of like that, but it's also a reminder of, uh, at least for me anyway, Space Grass by Clutch. <clears throat> Anywho, as far as what else I had on here, I wanted to talk about this one because this is kind of, actually, this is very predictable. Um, I think it's because of the fact that, that Bitcoin is capable of being entirely outside of the... Uh, current monetary system it's not not terribly uh how should i say it? They, they don't know how to handle it really but um i i i was i was on the fence with this one because i mean people can be silly sometimes um and uh basically they could be looking at their uh their taxes or their tax burden and saying you know what uh I'm not sure that I want to indicate exactly how much I have in cryptocurrencies to the IRS. And uh, that's much to the chagrin of the IRS, but you got to think about it this way. What exactly were you going to spend the money on? Maybe the people that have cryptocurrencies don't want to cash them out to experience a taxable event just so they can pay you. I think that's that's one of those things. Is like... Uh, 
until it's actually utilized as fiat, I don't believe it is a taxable event, and regardless of what it's actually being utilized for. So, as far as, if I were to, at one point or another, liquidate enough that my taxable event in total for any anim actually exceeded a, uh, a taxable level, like, you know, I think the, the threshold is somewhere under five figures, um, it's like, you know, $10,000 or some shit like that, if you don't make more than $10,000, you don't have to report um, the the year that I do that, the way that I will take care of it or, or address it is I'll assess my total expenditures from from crypto to fiat at the point that I actually realized profit in fiat. And, you know, so say I put a, a, a dollar in and I get out five dollars, okay? So the the four dollars is is taxable income, all right, and whatever rate that they're going to charge me that f- for making the money, which kind of disincentivizes making money, doesn't it? Um, whatever rate they were going to charge me for that, what I would do is I would take the total amount that I ha- that I actually made, estimate what it would be. For me to also take care of the tax burden for that, you know, like what, what, how much my tax burden was, and then also on top of that, the percentage for the additional friction that I would experience between Bitcoin and fiat currency, you know, so say I had to sell some Bitcoin, well, as far as I'm concerned, that that's a material loss. So I could I could probably calculate it that way too, <laughs> um, but the point being, so like you know, if I have to pay them three hundred bucks, you know, I I figured that is a, a taxable event in the amount that I'm going to pay them. So you know, if it's ten thousand dollars, ten thousand three hundred dollars will be my total taxable event because I'll have to pay them three hundred dollars and uh, estimated based on that. You know, so whatever it may be, you know, 300 and change. But the point being is that that's about how I would report taxes or report my crypto earnings uh, to the IRS or other entity were I to ever experience <coughs> a taxable level of expenditure, which I have not because I'm... I'm I think I've said this on the show quite a bit, but I'm like the worst trader in cryptocurrency. Anyway, continuing on. IRS stymied over American cryptocurrency traders' reluctance to report earnings. February 15th, 2018. Oh my God, Time Traveler. This is by Mark Lyford. Again, time, tra- time Traveler, this is actually from tomorrow. As cryptocurrency investors continue to see gains, it appears they're also continuing to stay quiet about their earnings to avoid taxation from the IRS, which is actually a patriotic act, I might add. Where are the American crypto taxpayers? With roughly a month and a half left until April 17th, tax filing deadline the IRS has reportedly only received 18.3 million individual tax returns so far, 13% of the total expected. Although it's still early in the tax season, it appears as though American taxpayers are loath to report their gains and losses this year, and the IRS is shocked, shocked I tell you, at the turnout or lack thereof. Cryptocurrency trading saw a huge surge in 2017 as the price for Bitcoin skyrocketed, climbing from just around $1,000 at the beginning of January 2017 to a staggering all-time high of nearly $20,000 in December of that same year. 
Although it remains unclear exactly how many Americans hold Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies, early data from one of the leading online tax prepar preparation services suggests that only 0.04% of U.S. tax filers have reported gains or losses involving cryptocurrency to the IRS. This figure is in stark contrast with the 7% of Americans estimated to own cryptocurrency and presumably owe taxes on their investments. Not really. Credit Karma, an online credit monitoring service that also offers free tax preparation and filing services, reported that of the 250,000 Americans who use their online tax services, less than 100 of them reported any taxable income derived from cryptocurrencies. That's less than 0.0004%. In contrast, in a recent joint survey conducted by Credit Karma Tax and Qual Qual Qualtrics, 2,000 American cryptocurrency owners were polled and 57% of them stated they'd realize gains on their cryptocurrency investments, taxable revenue in the eyes of the IRS. Further, 59% of the respondents admitted that they had never reported those gains to the IRS. It is a revelation that Jagat Chawla, <clears throat> general manager for Credit Karma Tax was unsurprised by. He explained that Americans with more complex tax, situ tax situations tend to file closer to the deadline, adding, however, given the popularity of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in 2017, we'd expect more people to reporting. Not me. And continuing on here. Likewise, high-profile Bitcoin investors have been warning others to comply with the IRS regulations. Mike Novogratz, the billionaire hedge fund manager who now invests mainly in cryptocurrencies, warned, quote, Listen, the IRS is going to come after people. People are making real money, real money now, so the IRS isn't stupid. Last year, the IRS successfully sued Coinbase, a popular cryptocurrency exchange, for access to customer, account, uh, customer records after less than 1,000 people reported losses or gains from Bitcoin in 2015. So to all our American readers and crypto investors, it's time to get ready. The tax man cometh, and with April 17th not too far off, He'll, he'll be here before you know it. Um, you know what? Like I said, I'll report cryptocurrency earnings when I actually achieve a taxable threshold. You know, I, I'm so far below it that <clears throat> I, I, in, in my eyes, it's not actually worth, <laughs> worth it. I mean, for one thing, the the earnings that I have made most of them are actually still invested. So, you know, it's it's like you want to tell me to liquidate some of my investment just to pay you on profits I have not actually experienced yet. I mean, for all I know, the exchange could go dead tomorrow with all of my fucking funds that I was in sh invested in completely lost to me. And then what? You're going to come after me for funds that were were there that I had no access to and actually and never actually realized as a material profit? Give me a break. That's bullshit. I mean, that's that's like taxing a a, a fucking milk farmer for profits that he didn't make based on the number of cows that he had. You know, what if the cows didn't produce enough milk, but you've got this formula that figures out, oh, you know, they should have produced X amount of milk, and they didn't, but you need to pay for all that. I think that's a bunch of bullshit. 
And so the IRS, again, uh, they're, they're going to be experiencing this pretty much everywhere. And they have been experiencing this pretty much everywhere. That people are as apt to report their cryptocurrency earnings as they are to report their earnings on baseball baseball card sales, you know, or maybe trading wines or something like that. They're, they're not paying on the arbitrage on a bottle of wine. You know, if you if you happen to make a, a decent percentage, like you know, you trade one vintage for another, and you actually have a a market where you experience a significant markup on based on your initial investment, are, are you really going to be uh, are, are you going to be reporting that? I mean, I, I would suppose if you were making like bazillions of dollars doing this, it was your like main stock in trade, possibly. But if it were an incidental trade. An incidental sale? No. And you certainly wouldn't be expected to be taxed on that bottle of wine before you actually realized a profit on it. Now would you? And you certainly wouldn't liquidate the wine just so you could pay tax on earnings that you haven't actually realized on the wine. That doesn't make any fucking sense at all. I mean, what's the IRS going to do? Come and get a goblet of wine from you or a, a shot of rare vintage whiskey or a, a, a picture of your, your Van Gogh? You know, a ride in your Ferrari? Something like that? I mean, come on now. Give me a fucking break. Now, in the event that you actually experience a significant material profit in your bank account, in fiat currency of your nation, then yes, report your fucking earnings and be smart about it because they will come after you for that shit. But, again, you know, if, you, if you're if you piddly ass fucking just above hobby trader like I am, uh... Yeah, as long as you're not actually experiencing significant profits, you know, you're not taking profit every week at, you know, a significant amount. You know, like if you if you took a thousand bucks profit every week that you were trading, okay, yeah, report $52,000 of income and then contrast all of your losses against it. You know, maybe, maybe at one point you were actually at like, you know, 150000 And because you actually hit that peak, they want, they want to tax you on that. No, I only experienced $52,000. Here's the bank records. Here's the fucking transaction fee, uh, the transaction IDs of all the Bitcoin transactions that I did. Here you go. You know, I mean, I, I, I understand their intent here. Okay, and their intent is... That if you're moving around millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of cryptocurrencies, that they would like to tax you on it. And I, I can understand that that tendency. However, I don't believe that they actually it's actually within their purview to do so, because it's they are operational on fiat markets based on the national or or national currencies national currency or national currencies of other nations that are circulated in conventional markets but again you know unrealized profit from from crypto trading no i don't, I don't believe that's actually tax taxable profit i don't believe it's taxable assets where you know they can look at you and say oh you you have x amount of you know, X amount of dollars in, in Bitcoin. You have six million, six thousand dollars in Bitcoin. Uh, we want to tax you based on that. No, no, no. And I mean, if you want to go that route, there, there's only one way I would consider it even feasible, and that's that we're allowed to report on February sixteenth at eleven fifty nine a.m. Or you know when whenever it switches or, or p.m. yeah eleven fifty nine p.m. and then uh, yeah 
then then I'll I'll base what I'm gonna pay you based on exactly what I have at that point, maybe. But I I don't think so. Especially if I didn't actually liquidate at that point the whole thing, realize the profit, pay you, and then reinvest it. I, I don't think that's that's very nice at all. I mean, it, it, tell that to all the fucking 401k holders. We want you to liquidate all of your 401k every year, report on, report on your realized profit, pay taxes on that realized profit, and then you're free to put your money back operational again. Oh, that's bullshit. Again, realized profit. This is the taxable aspect of your earnings, your income. You know, when you when you take, you know, six thousand dollars off of one exchange, put it on another exchange and convert it into US dollars that goes into your bank account, okay, that might be a taxable event. Because now you have realized a profit in fiat currency. You've experienced six thousand dollars worth of profit. It, there you go. And maybe it wouldn't even be six thousand dollars worth of profit. You know, what I mean, especially if you put in two thousand dollars to get the six thousand out. Now we're only talking about four thousand dollars worth of profit. And okay, you want a tax based on that? That's there you go. That's some fucking income. But again, I, I'm talking about if you are actually realizing a profit in fiat currencies. Or, there, one, one other consideration I would make is if you are buying physical goods directly with cryptocurrencies at the point of sale. Now, as far as what your tax liability would be for that, Personally, I believe that it, if you take the item, say, oh, I don't know, you know, a, a water bottle or a Big Mac, okay? Big Mac, $4.59 according to the U.S. market. If I were to buy a Big Mac, which I, I don't because I don't eat McDonald's, um, <clears throat> if I were to buy a Big Mac... And I were to use Bitcoin, if, if McDonald's would allow me to use Bitcoin to pay for the Big Mac, the $3.59 or $4.59 or whatever it was that I paid for the Big Mac, that would be a taxable event. You know, because say I did that every day, right? And that those kind of accumulate. So 300 times, about 1200 bucks worth of Big Macs that would com that I I would consider to be realized profit because it, you you were able to get something in exchange for it in a material sense that did have a value determined denominated in US dollars But again, the, this is all based on, on the idea that you haven't already been taxed on the cryptocurrency. Like, assuming for a moment if you were to be paid in Bitcoin, you know, they determine an hourly rate for your, for your wages and they pay you at the end of the week that amount of Bitcoin. If at that point... You were tax. You you experience income tax and all that other shit. It's already taxed, and I mean then then your your tax profile changes to the non-taxed income and actual realized profits. But yeah, that, there are already models for determining your actual tax liability. And they're relatively simple, and people have been trying to make them more complicated because they want to create more hook points and more jobs to determine exactly where you're going, what, how much you should be getting taxed at any one point, and what's fair and what's not fair. And then they got tax attorneys. And, Fuck all that bullshit. 
And we, we, we got all this all locked down already. We don't even need that stuff. And so, you know, it, it tails back to my idea that, you know, governments, you have the blockchains of these currencies to track whether or not they're, they're being utilized for illicit activity. Not that you can actually do anything to stop it, because then it would, and then you would be experiencing whatever issues you put on everybody else with regard to cryptocurrency. And there would be, I'm sure, some sort of exemption where you have private over-the-counter markets and stuff like that. But that always changes the relationship. You know, when you're when you're liquidating some cryptocurrency for fiat currency, you experience it just like anybody else does. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw back down into a little bit of music. I'm feeling the need to quickly rehydrate here. And uh, I've been wanting to play some Megadeth. And uh, yeah, here we go. Hangar 18, here on Coin Metal. And that was a little Rammstein there. Bootditch. And, uh... <laughs> I'm almost glad I don't understand German. <laughs> I looked up the lyrics for that song just to do it, and, uh... I tell you what, man. <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you, that th there's a reason they don't play that song on public radio. <laughs> I'm not even going to go into it. Use your own curiosity. Follow the link as you like. The Google is your friend. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, we were talking all about how the IRS wants to hammer down on everybody because nobody's actually talking about how much they're actually earning in cryptocurrencies. Well, here's the flip side of it, which will probably show us that Nobody will really give a fuck about how much the IRS is assessing in cryptocurrency income or what people are reporting or whatever. Anyway, here we go. This is on uh, newsbtc.com. Citrix. Research indicates 50% of large UK businesses have stockpiled digital currency. wonder if they're going to report it. This is by uh, Thomas Delhunty. Uh, so yes, penis. Uh, this is authored on February 15th, 2018. Another fucking time traveler. Bastards. Let me try that thing out, man. I want to go back and, and fish the early 1900s. Continuing on. New research by Citrix suggests that 50% of large UK businesses have accumulated a stockpile of digital currency in case of a ransomware attack. <laughs> That's a business expense. <laughs> and just 7% are only stockpiling Bitcoin. The vast majority, 93%, are spreading the risk by investing in other digital currencies as well. The research commissioned by Citrix and carried out by OnePoll is based on interviews with 750 IT decision makers in companies with 250 or more employees across the UK to, un to uncover the extent to which large British businesses are accumulating stores of digital currencies, the impact of the fluctuating price of digital currencies, and how organizations plan to keep these investments secure. Diversifying The poll revealed that 9 out of 10 of the respondents that do keep a ready stockpile of digital currency stockpile Bitcoin. While Bitcoin has proven extremely popular, the vast majority of these companies have also invested in additional digital currencies. More than half, 54%, have bought Litecoin, 
but sig a significant portion of these organizations have also invested in Ethereum, 43%, Ethereum Classic, 33%, Ripple, 33%, and Dash, 29%. In fact, as noted above, just 7% of large UK businesses are choosing to ac accumulate Bitcoin only. Returns While more UK businesses are building a ready stockpile of digital currency rising from 42% in 2016 to 50% in 2017, the number of Bitcoin kept on standby has remained largely consistent. Large UK businesses now stockpile an average of 24 Bitcoin, only one more than the 2016 average. This consistency in terms of the amount of Bitcoin kept on standby may reflect many organizations' decision to cash in on fluctuating prices to make a profit. The poll uncovered that more than half, 57% of those companies stockpiling Bitcoin, have sold some of their supply to make a profit. An additional 2 out of 5, 38% of these businesses are currently considering making a sale, leaving just 5% choosing to keep all of their Bitcoin. Security Almost 2 out of 3, 64% of those companies keeping a ready supply of Bitcoin believe that its inflated price has led cyber criminals to target their Bitcoin stockpile. In fact, large British businesses are very aware of the cyber threat to valuable Bitcoin wallets. Only 5% of organizations which stockpile the currency have not taken any steps to protect their Bitcoin reserves. Of those which have made changes to secure their Bitcoin assets, more than half, 52%, have used specific backup procedures. Popular security measures include using cold storage slash offline storage, 36%, moving to multiple wallets, 36%, using a dedicated computer, 35%, and using dual control, 22%, where multiple people are required to access the cryptocurrency. Very secure. <clears throat> Concerns Value, Internal Policy, and Security More organizations are investing in digital currencies, yet its value is a key deterrent. More than one-third of large UK businesses polled Site concerns that the digital currency will crash. 35% and fluctuating prices, 34%, as factors that discourage them from stockpiling digital currencies. Additionally, almost 1 out of 5, 18%, are concerned that the business will not be able to cash the cryptocurrency in when required. Why would they be quote-unquote required, I wonder? Continuing on, organizational policies and uncertainty are also holding companies back. One out of three admit that the fact they don't have a policy on how to deal with digital currency as a type of company asset deters them from stockpiling a digital currency, while 31% pinpoint the lack of an assigned budget to use purchased digital currencies as a discouraging factor. Security concerns are similarly rife. <clears throat> Almost one out of three, 31%, believe a stockpile of digital currency might make the business a target for cyber criminals, while almost one out of five, 18%, worry that it might put them at risk of insider theft. That, that number should be a lot higher, honestly. Chris Mayers, Citrix Chief Security Architect, sums up the finding as, uh, findings as follows. Initially, many organizations were treating ransomware as a cost of doing business, just like shrinkage and fraud in some sectors, and building a stockpile of cryptocurrency to cover potential cyber ransoms. Yet, this is changing, and as companies begin to embrace its potential, as a revenue driver 
as well as an alternative means to pay for staff and, and services. As British companies continue to build and diversify their cryptocurrency positions, vital security measures must be put in place to protect those reserves and ensure they can be used for a growing range of business processes instead of falling into criminal hands through ransom or theft. Hmm. I, I have to agree with that assessment. Um, I, I think that... Um, <laughs> watch out for your own bunghole, man. I, I say it all the time on this show. And I, I don't think UK businesses should be any different in that. I mean, most certainly take the due diligence. Learn about the technology that you're trying to use. And select the best security measures for retaining it. Because why invest in it if it's just going to get stolen from you? Um, but yeah, I... Um, I can understand a lot of these numbers. I think some of these concerns are a little bit high, but, eh. You know, the uh, this one, additionally, almost one out of five, 18% are concerned that the business will not be able to cash the cryptocurrency in when required. That's, that's not really a problem. I mean, if you can't cash out your cryptocurrencies... There's probably something much worse going on than anything that could possibly concern you there. I mean, like, the electricity is gone, or the internet is gone. You know, it was some, something like that, okay? In which case, you have much bigger worries than whether or not you can liquidate your cryptocurrency. However, if you have been retaining them on, say, a paper wallet... As long as there's a network live somewhere for those coins, you'll be able to cash them out. You know, as to being being required or, you know, for whatever reason, being required to cash them out, if you're having to tap into your crypto funds to cover quote-unquote required expenses, um, you're probably doing it wrong. You know, you're you're over investing your in your cryptocurrency fund, you know, because you, you need more readily available cash. There there are other things that you could be investing in that that might not produce the same rate of return, um, but certainly safer and more conventional investments. You know, again, they're not you're not gonna see the, the same rocket sauce that you do you know, if you were invested in, say, Ethereum or Bitcoin or something like that. But a lot of these concerns that you have could just be shifted over to another party. You know, like theft. You know what? You're, you're just as likely to get stolen from with Goldman Sachs as, or, or, or Wells Fargo or U.S. Bank or any of, ever, any other, of a number of other banks and legacy financiers. Uh, you, you're just as you're just as likely to lose your money there as you are to experience a material loss in cryptocurrencies due to due to theft or malfeasance or whatever. I I think that's that again is a little bit of an overblown concern only because like right here, one out of five eighteen percent worried that it might put them at risk of insider theft. Now that 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 number I think should be much higher because there are custodial concerns they are in your possession if somebody else has access to them and you have not done due diligence with regard to either vetting them for the position or properly securing the bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies to begin with that, again, you have a bigger concern than the than eighteen uh, percent. I mean, sorry, that's that's the thing with Bitcoin. I mean, you, you you should probably put that percentage up about the level that you would if you were say um, storing large amounts of silver or gold, um, whatever amount of pilferage you might expect from your. Uh, from your employees that that's about the rate of concern you should have with regard to the security of your cryptocurrencies 
The safest hands are always your own, folks. I mean, you can go through several different security measures that are very low tech and very low cost. You know, like like the way I do it, I put the security outside of the device. You know, the device that I'm a- accessing my accounts on, two-factor authentication, multi-signatures, all these things. I, well, multi-signatures to me, it's it's just like joint custody of something. But again, you know, with relatively low-tech measures, I, I can I can achieve a decent level of security. I mean, it might not be like Pentagon secure, but it's pretty fucking secure. You know, I mean, you you'd have to have like physical access to my shit, and, and even then, you'd have to have physical access to all my shit, not just some of my stuff. And the, the likelihood of that is very low, especially if you're trying to get into my, my cryptocurrencies. I'm I'm probably going to be defending my investments. And I'm not I'm not like a badass or anything, but I'm not a pushover either. I might just strangle you in the process. Anyway, so yeah, you know it with regard to what we were talking about earlier with the IRS I would imagine that the regulatory uncertainty, you know, with regard to how the IRS wants to regard cryptocurrencies, um, I'm sure that that has a significant amount of uh, of weight with regard to the decision to tie up funds in cryptocurrencies. I mean, it would certainly be a concern for me, you know, if I were if I were looking at tying up a significant portion of my investment specifically in cryptocurrencies, yeah, you know, that that would be a concern. Anyway, I got this other article here that it's been kind of nibbling at me because I, I've been seeing some a little bit of movement with regard to Ripple. And uh I don't know if I want to touch on this one yet. I, let me check through this really quick because I've got like 80 other articles and I want to make sure that uh, that I'm actually... Oh, here we go. Th- this is this is more subject-based. I, I mean, I, I, I'd love to get into Ripple. There, there's plenty to talk about with regard to them, but I don't, I don't really consider them a cryptocurrency as such. I mean, they... They can be considered as a cryptocurrency, but I don't really put them on the same level that I do with Bitcoin, because there's a great deal more centralization involved. Anyway, this one's on the Bitcoin news, and uh, something to consider when uh, when talking about tax liability and whatnot. Here we go. Europol claims that 5.5 billion dollars laundered using cryptocurrency and this is written on uh, February 13th 2016 and wait a minute is this the original site for this I did check and verify because I'm not I'm not seeing uh, oh, let's see ah there we go I had to make sure that it was actually the original article because usually when it's not they don't indicate who wrote it I've tracked down what I think is the original source for this. It looks like it is. Yeah. Okay, well, anyway, as I was saying, this is the original source for it. Europol claims $5.5 billion laundered via cryptocurrency. And this was written, written by Adam James on February 12th, 2018, 11 p.m. So, yes, penis... Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies have long had a reputation for being the payment tools of criminals. Now Europol claims billions of dollars are being illegally laundered with cryptocurrency in Europe. Large estimations. According to the European Union Agency for Law Enforcement Cooperation, Europol, 3 to 4 billion pounds, 4.1 to 5.5 billion of criminal money 
is being laundered using cryptocurrencies in Europe alone. Europol's director, Rob, Rob Wainwright, told BBC's Panorama, It's growing quite quickly, and we're quite concerned. They're not banks, and governed by a central authority, so the police cannot monitor, monitor these transactions, and if they do identify him as a criminal, they have no way to freeze the assets, unlike in, regular banking, in the regular banking system. Why should they be able to freeze your assets? Continuing on. Hypothetically, the process of laundering money via Bitcoin would involve purchasing the cryptocurrency, breaking it, breaking into its smallest values called Satoshis, and distributing it to various addresses. Some reports claim this process, quote, erases any trail that the criminal money might ordinarily leave behind. But that isn't entirely true. Bitcoin itself isn't completely anonymous and can be traced by savvy investigators via public ledgers. Other, quote, privacy coins like Monero, however, are more difficult to track. <clears throat> Pardon me. Europol's shocking claim conveniently comes at a time when many European governments are calling for a crackdown on cryptocurrency. French Finance Minister Bruno Le Maire, Le Maire and interim government, uh, German Finance Minister Peter Altmaier have both called for global regulation, citing, quote, damaging consequences for misinformed investors who, don't, who do not understand the risks they are exposing themselves to. Actually, dude, I'm pretty sure they understand exactly what they're doing, or at least the vast majority of them do. Continuing on, British Prime Minister Theresa May has also expressed her concerns regarding cryptocurrency's criminal usage, stating that she is looking, quote, very seriously at cryptocurrencies because of the way they are used, particularly by criminals. International Monetary Fund Chief Christine Lagarde also recently told the World Go Government Summit in Dubai that, quote, there is probably quite a bit of dark, of dark activity in cryptocurrencies while claiming that regulation is an inevitability. Fabian Lebro, VP of San Francisco-based cybersecurity company Risk I IQ, also did not mince words when talking about cryptocurrencies' criminal potential. Quote, we are seeing threat actors around the world exploiting what is already hostile currency in the, lo in the lawless digital world. Threat actors hack vulnerable sites or spin up fake illegitimate websites to siphon money off of major brands, often with ty typo squatting domains and fraudulent branding. Europol's claim also comes on the heels of high-profile uh, high cybercriminal Sergei Medved Medvedev's arrest in Thailand. Medvedev, the Russian co-founder of, of criminal marketplace in fraud, was reportedly in possession of more than 100,000 bitcoins when his apartment was raided. Did he legitimately earn them? That's my question. What do, you what do you make of Europol's claims that upwards of $5.5 billion is being laundered in Europe? Do you think governments around the globe are going to crack down harder on criminals using cryptocurrencies? Let us know in the comments below. And you know what? Let's show those comments. Uh -huh. Oh, here we go. This is by Crypto Hippie. Ooh, it looks so much. It looks so much when you put put like that. But in reality, it's four percent of criminality gen, criminally generated money that is put into crypto, meaning ninety six percent of crypto money is clean. But that doesn't make headline wowzers, right? Or create fud and misinformation necessary for nefarious agendas. I couldn't agree more. Crypto hippie. Damn, Skippy. 
Um, yeah, the um, the concerns about money laundering in in my book are completely overblown. the The bigger concern, I think, should be the fact that people are diverting to cryptocurrencies as a means of transacting for certain items. You know, the to me that represents a failure within the conventional markets. Either there's too much regulation with regard to the item in question, there's too much regulation with regard to transacting for the item in question, whether it be drugs or bullets or guns or or whatever. You know, some sort of service online, you know, some blog that you write. I mean, if somebody pays you for that in cryptocurrency, are they laundering money? I don't think so, but just because the event that they, when they paid you or tipped you or whatever, just because that wasn't actually registered in the IRS's database or anybody else's database, they interpret that to mean that, that that's fraudulent activity or potentially, or not fraudulent, but you know, um, illicit activity. Now, I think I've been pretty clear about what I think a taxable event is. Unless you're actually cashing those funds out, you've not experienced a taxable event yet. So there. But yeah, I, I think that governments, generally speaking, are either going to get it or not get it. You know, I think that some of them do get it. And like South Korea... Their, their finance minister just basically said, you know what, the fact of the matter is we really don't have any right to try and regulate this shit, so just don't fuck up and lose all your money. <laughs> you know, watch out for your ass out there. Somebody's out to rip you off too. You know, the, these markets aren't clean. They aren't quote-unquote safe in any way, shape, or form, any more safe than any other market you could be investing in, so... Just disabuse yourself of those illusions now. And honestly, I thought that was the most realistic perspective I've heard about the, uh, from a government. You know, I mean, the CFTC and SEC have said some intelligible things with regard to cryptocurrencies. However, I think that either A, they're being fed disinformation... B, they're not bothering to do their homework, or C, they're, rep they're misrepresenting the facts in order to make a case to tax Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies unnecessarily and regulate them and the participants in them pretty much the way that they do with traditional and conventional markets. I mean, and what's funny to me is a lot of people that came into cryptocurrency markets came into cryptocurrency markets because they were financially inclined, but the regulatory burden pretty much kept them out of other trading options. You know, lack of ability to get a bank account. That's kind of an inhibiting factor, you know? But anyway, yeah, I, I think the concern about quote unquote money laundering, it, it's completely overblown. You know, the, what, what, again, should be the bigger concern is, what is driving us to this? Are you really, are you asking too much of us in conventional markets that we feel that we need to skirt you, that we need to try and find means to circumvent your control? I think that's more likely than, you know, people are coming here just to buy the drugs. And I, 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 that's pretty much been the case. I, you know, the number of actual quote-unquote drug users I've ran into with regard to people that I've ran into with regard to cryptocurrencies is very, very tiny. The, the, the number of, of people that actually are involved in, in any kind of illicit drug activity, I don't know any that are involved with cryptocurrencies. All the people I've ever met that are, have been involved with that kind of stuff dealing in fiat currency. So, I, I really don't see what the concern is. You know? <sighs> anyway, continuing on. I got one last short one here. And this one I think is uh, 
I, I think this is probably a bigger motivator as to why um, some would like to see more regulation in cryptocurrencies. And uh, here we go. This one is on the BitcoinNews.com. Europe's small banks see crypto as opportunity to take on big banks. And this was authored on February 14th of 2018. Damn son of a bitch. Was not the original source. Here we go. This one's on the Bitcoinist.com. Sorry. Europe's small small banks see crypto as opportunity to take on big banks. At least it's the same title, right? And uh, this is authored by Nikita Blows, uh, February thirteenth, two thousand eighteen, at approximately seven thirty p.m. Um, going by the name Nikita, no, no penis. Unlike larger banks who are criticizing crypto. Some smaller institutions in Switzerland, Germany, and Liechtenstein are bucking the trend. They are interested in, uh, in offering their clients opportunities to be a part of the digital currency revolution. Big banks are losing out. Whether it be as a method to control the financial freedom that cryptocurrencies offer, or as a genuine way to introduce virtual currencies to the masses, Regulation is on the increase, or at least talk about it is. While some major banks are declining crypto-related transactions, smaller institutions are of the opposing view. According to Financial Times, Swiss private banks Von Tobel and Falcon Bank, as well as Fidor Bank in Germany and Bank Frick in Liechtenstein, have rather embraced the industry by offering a range of cryptocurrency services. There are risks involved, but there are also really big opportunities. We know what to do from a security perspective, so this is a big opportunity for banks like us. And this is Eddie Wagerer, who is the chief executive of Bank Frick. And that's what he had to say. Wagerer added to the common course that bigger institutions see cr- virtual currencies as a danger to their well-established status quo. He said that larger banks were scared of crypto and that, quote, because they don't understand them, they feel threatened. The popularity of virtual currencies is undeniable, which means that even if these bigger institutions aren't interested, others most certain, most definitely are. President of the Crypto Valley Association in Switzerland, Oliver Bussman, has said that, quote, more and more bankers are coming in, hoping to capitalize on the lucrative, in, lucrative gap left by their larger counterparts. ICOs are also feeling the love. Bank Frick offers advisory support for startups conducting ICOs, and they even screen investors. Payment for their services is in the form of cryptocurrencies, with ICOs having a having the cloud of possible fraud hanging over them. Wargerer has said these services are in quote huge demand, but the firm is very selective, having worked with ten ICOs so far. In their bid to embrace crypto, the bank also facilitates investor access to crypto exchanges offers a crypto tracker fund and keeps a hard copy of coin coin codes safe in their vault. The given trend supports a prediction by Bitcoin expert Andreas Antonopoulos, who stated that big banks will eventually lose ground to innovative fintech platforms and smaller banks, who are who are more willing to embrace open access, metric centric cryptocurrency. This approach will help them tap into the unbanked market, which includes over 4 billion people. Small banks won't be deterred. Even though global institutions aren't in favor of the digital financial future, these banks aren't concerned. Warger added, We hear these international statements. If it gets regulated, and it will get regulated, we will already comply with it. 
These smaller banks offer a wide range of crypto services to their clients. Von Tobel has a Bitcoin tracker and also has crypto betting facilities. Falcon Bank allows investors to buy virtual currencies and accepts proceeds from crypto sales. Fidor Bank not only offers a Eurobank account to Kraken, but also gives its German clients access to the US-based exchange. The main reason that larger financial, financial institutions give for their aversion to crypto is its alleged attractiveness for money laundering, tax evasion, financing terrorism, and other illegal activities, despite evidence to the contrary. However, Bussman has stated that these smaller banks could introduce their own processes such as screening their clients to ensure that they are not in breach of any financial laws or sanctions. Do you think that we'll see an increase in smaller banks offering crypto related services? Let us know in the comments below. Yes, I believe they will. No, we will not check the comments because we are running a teeny tiny bit close to the edge of the end of this episode. But yeah, I, I kind of expected something like that. That smaller banks that do have their shit together well enough to understand what they're doing will be investing in cryptocurrencies. That's just, it's almost a, a, just a given. You know, if they're inv if they're involved in any kind of high risk or higher risk investments, they're most certainly going to be involved in cryptocurrencies. Because I mean, we're we're really not all that quote unquote risky, with the exception, of course, of price volatility. But that's one of those things where if you stay in long enough, the prices that you expect it to get to will eventually be realized. It's just one of those things about crypto. It is. <clears throat> and it is with that that I would like to close out this episode. We will be back again on Friday. And we are <clears throat> tentatively, possibly, going to have a guest on Friday. Like I said, we're tentative. We're still, still hashing it out. Uh, but we will find out for certain, and I will be sure to post it on Twitter. Um, you can also find me on Facebook, on YouTube, and in the Telegram chat, and also IRC chat room for Verge Currency. And so, until Friday, I want y'all to trade safe. Do your homework. And watch out for your own bunghole, because nobody else is going to do it for you despite how much talk there is of trying to do something to that effect. Anyway, last dance for the evening. It's going to be some sixth. We have not played sixth all night, and so we will now. Weavers of Woe, last dance here on Coin Metal. Thank you very much for listening. Certainly appreciate your, your support. Like and subscribe on YouTube and follow me on Twitter. Thank you again, and ex have an excellent evening.